Hi, uh, welcome to uh, another Davies uh, Veterinary Specialist Out of Hours podcast. Um, we do these from time to time, uh, as you know, and we typically host them in the pub or in a tea room or something like that. But as it's the COVID lockdown, we're doing them remotely, hence the different format. Uh, my name's Ian Battersby, and um, today I'm uh, uh, with Patricia, who's a member of the medicine team, and we're going to talk about uh, leptospirosis. Um, so hello, Patricia. Can you see Hi, me? Ian. How are you? Oh, I'm good. We haven't seen each other now remotely for 24 hours. Um, how, how, how was your last bit? What have you been doing? Well, you know, just my working from home duties. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's funny, but um, I thought um, I would have a lot of spare time, but, you know, just checking emails, writing letters, preparing podcasts. Oh, right. <laughs> what a coincidence. Yeah. Well, I, I went for my little walk and then, you know, yesterday evening I, I went and stood in the spare room because I haven't been in there for a couple of days, just to vary yeah. it up a bit. <laughs> you find every corner of the house Absolutely. for a bit of solitude. Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, so uh, well, leptospirosis, um, you know, we're, we're, uh, uh, an area of interest. You know, certainly, you know, this is different to leishmania, which was a, an exotic, uh, you know, more of an exotic kind of less common presentation and certainly something that... Um, you know, has been increased, you know, there certainly has been a lot more increasing prevalence reported of, mm -hmm. of leptospirosis in dogs. So, um, again, just to start off with a little bit of basics, really, um, you know, I, well, it's not really, I don't find it basics. I find the all, you know, the, I always have to sit down and concentrate about the different species of lepto, the sera groups and the sera bars and things like that. So if we maybe oh, yeah. start with that and you overview that as a, as a starting point. Yeah, I mean, the taxonomy of leptospira is very confusing. Um, and um, and it's very complex. And I think even people that um, study leptospira at the research level also find the taxonomy confusing. And it's changing as well. But um, you know, historically, there are two species of uh, leptospira. So um, the pathogenic leptospira, which are the ones that we are interested in, which is the um, leptospira interrogans species. And then there are saprophytic leptospira species, which is leptospira biflexa. And then, so it's the leptospira interrogans that we, we are interested in because they're the ones that cause disease in dogs. And then within that species, um, there are serovars, um, depending on the kind of antigenic, if you like, component of the, of the leptospira. So there are different serovars. And some of those serovars are antigenically similar and classed or kind of clustered within serogroups. Wow. Okay. If that makes any sense. So when you're talking about leptospira, you would normally talk about the genus, which is leptospira, then the species, which is leptospira interrogans, okay. then the serovar, so for example, leptospira interrogans, um, Bratislava, yep. and then the strain, um, if there is a strain within that, that species. Okay. Wow, yeah. Um, so, but but to, be, to to add to that, um, now that we just know just to make more it a little about, bit more complicated. Yes. yes. <laughs> so the classification is changing as we know more about the genetics of leptospira. Okay. Um, so um, pro, there are more. There are actually more than two species, and you know, the, if you like, the the genetic classification is different from the immunologic classification, but. We are, we're still using the immunologic classification, so we're still talking about zero bars and zero groups and so on. Okay. So it is confusing, and I don't, I don't think we need to worry too much about it when you, we're just looking at it from a clinical perspective. But um, it does become quite confusing because sometimes the zero bars have the same name as the zero group, so um, yeah. you can get quite confused. Absolutely. And um, I suppose looking at, you know, we've talked a bit about there's so many different zero groups, zero bars and things like that. Um, what about species that are affected by, I mean, uh, uh, you, know, you said that there's pathogenic, non-pathogenic, are some mm -hmm. strains, serovars, you know, affecting some, you know, dogs, cats, humans, you know, what, what kind of animals, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, yeah. So again, that's interesting because, yes, um, so serovars um, have differences in their um, ability to infect different species. Yeah. Um, so there are, and, and that matters to us because some, some, Mammals um, or some animals will be um, reservoir hosts and some will be incidental hosts. And the incidental hosts are more likely to get sick with the disease. Okay. Whereas the reservoir host is more adapted to the organism and okay. may just act ex indeed as a reservoir. So it survives the infection, it's asymptomatic, but it's shedding the leptospira. Um, okay. So, for example, 
if you think about like the spiracter hemorrhagi, um, yeah. which is a very common cause of disease in dogs, um, so the the reservoir host would be rats, for example. So they will carry the disease, not get sick with it, and excrete the the leptospira in their urine, for example. Okay. And the dog will act as the incidental host that gets sick with the infection. Um, okay. Yeah. But for example, leptospira canicola, um, that the the dog may act as a reservoir host, okay. where they might not be clinically ill, but they might stay shedding. Um, okay. So yeah, different different species will affect. So different species of, uh, no, sorry, I shouldn't say different species, different serovars will affect um, different animals in different ways. Different ways. And how does that, I mean, what about, because uh, we, we talked about dogs, and that's one of the things that we focus on as, as primary you know, s small animal vets. Okay. What about cats? Yeah, so cats are interesting because we don't see a lot of clinical disease in cats. Um, but when they've done seroprevalent studies, we do see antibodies in cats. So they obviously become exposed. Okay. Um, and they've also been able to um, find um, leptospira in their urine. So okay. they, act, they can act as reservoir hosts. And what the role it plays in clinical disease is unknown. Um, we know th there have been studies to show that cats with chronic kidney disease um, have higher incidence of um, antibodies or a higher prevalence of seropositivity than dogs without, uh, sorry, cats without chronic kidney disease. So it may well play a role in disease in cats, but that's not very well established. But okay. I mean, I've never seen a cat with clinical leptospirosis. If I have, I've, I've missed it. But um, it, well, I, it, I, I suppose I may not have, I mean, I, I suppose I wouldn't test routinely for it either. That's probably yeah. the other thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it might be, it, we may not be testing enough, but certainly yeah. they can they are antibody positive. Yeah. Um, and what about, I, I suppose what we should, I mean, we'll have to talk about health risk for staffs and owners at a late, you know, maybe at the end when we've kind of covered it in more detail. But what about, you know, it seems pertinent to just kind of touch on, you know, if you mentioned that some, some, you know, some of the leptospirosis, uh, leptospira, you know, speak, you know, uh, serogroups and serobars mm -hmm. are act as, you know, a, a, you know, a, it could be potentially reservoirs in humans and potentially mm -hmm. in cats. Mm -hmm. Is that, you know, are some of those species of lepto um, potentially zoonotic? So if you've got a dog that's a carrier or a cat that's a carrier, potentially zoonotic to a human or? or... Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, for sure it's a zoonotic disease and do people can be um, affected by um, similar serovats to um, dogs and, and, mm -hmm. um, and other mammals. Um, so, yes, there is definitely a risk um, to humans, although... Um, I, I believe that most of the um, reported cases in people have been from environmental exposure rather than exposure from pets. to okay. from pets. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. And well, thank you. I mean, because yeah, it is quite a complicated thing. So thanks for the simplifying that. that that's re you know, really useful. Um, so I guess what we should talk about is when we should consider this, um, you know, leptospirosis as a potential differential because, you know, as we've talked about in other podcasts, you can run a massive database and get mm -hmm. results that cloud the issue, you know, you get yeah. false positive and things. So, you know, what, what would be, you know, clinical, what would be clinical presentations that you think it's appropriate to run leptospirosis you mm -hmm. know, uh, testing in? Yeah. So, um, I mean, the most common clinical presentation with leptospirosis, I'm talking about dogs now, Mm. And the most common clinical presentation is acute kidney injury. Mm. Um, so if you have a dog that presents with acute kidney injury of a known etiology, then mm. leptospirosis is definitely something to rule out. Mm. Um, and particularly in combination with thrombocytopenia, that's highly suspicious. Mm. Um, um, other presentations would be some form of acute um, hepatopathy, so a cholestatic um, mm. liver disease, so a dog that presents with high bilirubin and um, elevation in liver enzymes, where there is no, not another obvious cause for the, for the cholestatic liver disease. Mm. That's another one. And of course, um, a syndrome that's becoming more and more recognized in people, and we are becoming more aware of it in dogs, which is um, the leptospira pulmonary hemorrhage syndrome, mm. where they develop pulmonary hemorrhage. Um, so respiratory signs, um, mm. and particularly um, when we see in radiographs um, 
suspicion of hemorrhage, particularly in the cododorsal lung fields, that um, that could be consistent with, with leptospirosis. Mm. If you have I mean, a combination of those things, then you would be very suspicious. Very suspicious. But even, if, even if you just have one of those, acute kidney injury or um, cholestatic liver disease or pulmonary hemorrhage of unknown origin, that would be that 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 would make you suspicious. So, so I guess um, you know, I think most people are familiar with the renal component, the mm -hmm. hepatic component. But certainly for me, in, over the last couple of years, I, I mean, it, certainly seeing studies showing the the incidence of pulmonary hemorrhage. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, would you agree that you know, if you, I mean, typically now, will you know, if you've got a pulmonary hemorrhage case, you know, patient that's dyspneic, you consider redenticide toxicity, mm -hmm. you consider angiostrongulus, yep. but leptospirosis is a mm -hmm. potential differential. Um, For sure, yeah. Yeah, and I've I've seen, you know, it's funny, isn't it? You kind of go in retrospect where, you know, I've seen cases where I've checked for, you know, the, the redenticide, the, you know, done radiographs, see, can see a hemorrhage, mm -hmm. um, you know, t tested or put them on therapy for, you know, angiostrongulus. But then, you know, I kind of think in, in retrospect, maybe I may have missed you know, mm -hmm. historically, you know, before we started realizing there's some cases of leptospirosis. Yes. Um, I haven't, I haven't had those kind of pulmonary cases. Are they, are they per acute? So they, you know, are they described as bleeding a lot so that literally they deteriorate very, very quickly or? So it's really variable. So even mm -hmm. some dogs with leptospirosis will uh, have pulmonary hemorrhage with no respiratory signs. Um, so, you know, and of course we don't know the incidence of this. In some studies they suggest it can be up to 60% of dogs with leptospirosis, but of course most dogs with leptospirosis don't get thoracic radiographs, particularly if they're not showing um, yeah. respiratory signs. So who knows what the incidence is, um, but not all of them would present with respiratory signs, so they can have pulmonary hemorrhage with, with no clinical signs or they can have overt um, respiratory signs. Yeah, I'm not so. saying that it should be the first differential, you know, with a dog oh, no. that presents with dyspnea. Um, but certainly if there are other suggestive signs, um, you know, an unvaccinated dog with um, with a history that could be consistent with leptospirosis, on top of that, maybe thrombocytopenic, and certainly with elevation in liver enzymes or isotemia, yeah, yeah. that should be very, very high on the list of yeah, differentials. Yeah, cool. So I guess we, I guess we, you know, if we, if we're suspecting this case, we should, you know, this case as potentially having leptospirosis, which is now a, a seamless link to move on to, um, to testing, mm -hmm. um, which as we know is never, there's never any black and white kind of testing really. It's, no. it's interpreting the result you get in, in, in the clinical picture. So, mm -hmm. you know, what, what, if you want to just overview the, you know, the kind of broad categories and the pros and cons of, of the different tests. Yes, so again, we said this um, with the, in the Lismania podcast, but when you're looking for an infectious disease, then you can either look for the actual organism itself, or you can look for evidence of exposure. So that's serology. Um, and that's the, also the case with leptospirin. So we're in slightly different ground with looking for the organism, because in this case, it's very difficult to visually see leptospira. Um, mm. So you, if, if you're lucky enough to work in an academic institution and you've got a dark field microscope, then you might be able to see leptospira in the urine, in a very mm. fresh urine sample using a dark field microscope, but that's not something that we are able to, to do in practice. Mm. And the sensitivity of that test is very low anyway. Mm. Um, and culture can take weeks or months. Um, so actual directly looking for the organism it's um usually not not viable in in, mm. in clinical practice so then we need to look at more sensitive ways at identifying the organism which would be pcr mm. and pcr can be very useful um but just bear in mind that pcr is not able to speciate it's not able to tell you which zero virus or zero group you're dealing with so it will just say yes to a pathogenic leptospira and that's it um and and, and so with that that then wouldn't differentiate between um, whether the patient is a carrier or, a, or an end stage. Host. Exactly. That's a very good point. No, yeah. it doesn't. So you can do a PCR in urine and get a mm. positive. Mm. And that, that does not necessarily mean that that's the cause of the clinical disease that that dog has. He might mm. just be a, cro a, a chronic shedder of leptospira. Mm. So that's why when you get the results of these tests, you always have to interpret them in light of the clinical picture. So if you have... I mean, if you have signs could, that would be consistent with leptospirosis and you've got a positive PCR in urine mm -hmm. or in blood, then mm -hmm. probably that dog has got, you can say with certain certainty that that dog has 
has got leptospira, but if the signs don't fit, just bear in mind that you might need to look um, for other potential causes. Yeah. And also remember that the sensitivity of PCR goes down dramatically when the animal is on antibiotics. Yeah. So okay. a negative PCR does not mean that the animal doesn't have leptospirosis. It just means that leptospira has not been found in that sample at that moment. In okay. Time. And I guess if you have a, uh, if you are going to use a PCR on a leptospirosis case, well, on a suspected leptospirosis case, do you do urine? Do you do blood? Do you do both? You know, um... So ideally you do both. The only thing is that these things can become quite expensive, mm. but you ideally do both. The reason being is that leptospira is first in the blood and then mm. after seven to 10 days, it will appear in the urine. But obviously, mm. that's going to be variable depending on the case. And when you see a case with leptospira, you don't know at what stage of the disease you are. Um, mm. Are we, um, when did that dog become infected? And so you, you don't really know the time scale. You just present it with mm. a dog with clinical signs of leptospirosis. So I suggest that you do both, that you do blood and then you do urine. Mm. If that's not financially viable, then then you have to think about the, the clinical progression of that dog. If it's a very acute case, then you might get a better chance finding it in the, in the blood. Sorry, If it's more chronic, a couple of weeks of the dog not being well, then maybe urine would be better. Um, okay. And as I say, if the dog's on antibiotics, then the likelihood is that you're going to get um, a negative result. Okay. And, and I suppose that, that it, that's going to be antibiotics that may... You know, be be an option that you you know one of the antibiotics that you may use to treat leptospirosis with. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I suppose that, I mean the, the other before PCRs we used to rely a lot on serology, and and I, I suppose you well what you're doing mm -hmm. is you're giving a very clear explanation as to the time points when these different tests are useful. So as you say mm -hmm. in a in a in an acute case, a blood PCR because you've got you know, you're potentially looking for an infection that's just starting, mm -hmm. you know, a, a urine sample in a chronic case, if it's a chronic shedder, but also after, I can't remember the time frame, was it, did you say before you start shedding in the urine, it was uh, seven, seven to 10 days, seven but you know, days. they're all very theoretical, but all very theoretical. Yeah. And serology is the test that we used to use traditionally, mm -hmm. but obviously there's a lag phase for that. Yes. So if you want to go through the, you know, when you consider serology pros and cons again, yeah, so historically, um, MAT testing, so microagglutination tests, have been considered kind of the gold standard for the diagnosis of leptospirosis. They have lots of, th there are some advantages and disadvantages of serology, but it's, um, you know, the, the, certainly the, the MAT testing has got quite important uh, weaknesses that we've all, we all realize when we're dealing with a clinical case. And um, so it relies on the ability of the patient's um, serum that hopefully has antibodies to agglutinate microspira um, that are grown in the lab. So you're looking for agglutination of your lab grown leptospira uh, mm. with the patient sample, and then you dilute it down and that's where the titus come in into. Okay. okay. Yes. So that's what an MAT is. It's very laborious. It's done in um, certain labs that um, are able to run this test um, and the turnaround is quite slow. So um, you know, you don't get an immediate result. And, and how easy is it to grow it to kind of... Leptospira? Yeah. Um, so not all labs are allowed to grow it and, and yeah. you know, they need very strict quality controls. So yeah. not, not easy at all, apart from being obviously dangerous as well. Which is a, another limitation, really, I yeah. guess. Yeah. So yeah. there are only okay. a few labs in the UK that, that, that would do this. And it's important to use certified labs that, that, um, that have... Um, um, quality controls and so on. Um, but sorry, I'm, I'm deviating a bit from your question because your question was about um, when does an animal become seropositive. And that um, that depends a little bit on which test, which serological test you're using and what antibodies that serological test is detecting. So typically the MAT test can take a couple of weeks um, mm. for those antibodies to be picked up by the, um, by the MAT testing. Mm. Um, and there are studies about this, you know, how sensitive the MAT test is in experimentally infected mm. dogs. Um, and you get quite a high incidence of negative results in the first two weeks of infection. Mm. So if you test the dog in the first two weeks of infection, you may well get a negative result, a false negative mm. result. Also, remember that these tests will pick up um, vaccinated uh, or vaccinal antibodies, um, mm. which can, you know, normally um, antibodies um, 
um, you know, IgG and IgM antibodies um, produced um, through vaccination are um, usually low, low titers and they don't mm -hmm. last for very long. But that, again, is extremely variable between dogs. So some vaccinated dogs will have antibodies for up to 12 months. Yeah. Most of them don't, but some of them do. So Like a, a um, super responder. Yes, yeah. yes. Normally they don't, they don't stay around for more than three months or so, but in some cases they can, they can float around for longer than that. So you can get, with the MAT testing, you can get false positive results and you can get um, false negative results. And you have to bear that in mind when you're interpreting um, a single MAT titer. And that's why we prefer paired samples. So you get a titer when you see the dog um, and you're suspicious of leptospira. So that's your baseline. And then you do another titer one to two weeks later and see if you have a rise in that titer. You're looking to a fourfold increase in the titer. Okay. Um, and that would be very suggestive of active infection. Mm. And that increases, if you do pair samples, that significantly increases sensitivity of MAT testing. Okay. Of course, you will still have the problem with the specificity, particularly in a dog that's been vaccinated recently. Yeah. OK, so, you, I mean, essentially a key with that is that you're looking for a quantification on that so that you can, yes. you know, it's not a positive or negative. It's a mm. degree of positive, a bit like what we talked about with the leash mania and monitoring yes. treatment. Yes. So, yeah. um, okay. And if you can do a combination of all of those tests, because, of course, the serological tests, particularly if you're looking at MAT testing that are not going to be done in clinics, that is good because it will give you an answer, but it won't give you an answer immediately, um, which... Mm you ideally want when you're dealing with a clinical case. So we normally use a combination of serology and PCR to try and get a diagnosis. And of course, clinical suspicion. So if yeah. you have a dog that fits clinically, then you might want to start treatment sooner rather than later, even if you don't have confirmation that that dog's got leptospirosis. Yeah. And I suppose, like you say, there's a, I mean, in an ideal world, you do all of it, but in the real world, you can't do all of it sometimes. No. So I guess considering the clinical presentation and your clinical suspicion is how you use that armory of tests you know mm -hmm. as we've talked about you know the acute cases you know prioritizing the pcr and the blood you know if, if mm -hmm. you think it's very acute um if it's a case that's been grumbling for a while then you know, we, you know particularly if it's had some kind of non-specific antibiotic therapy then you go down the serology route yes would you agree yes i yeah. agree i agree cool so um, if we diagnose a case or we are waiting for tests and we think that there's a very high suspicion and we can justify empirical treatment for mm -hmm. it um, mm -hmm. with our antibiotic stewardship yes. hat on, you know, <laughs> obviously I have to mention protect and good principles of antibiotic prescribing. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Good. <laughs> um, what, um, what, what, what treatment protocols are there? So um, in people, and interestingly, in people, um, they use an array of antibiotics for the treatment of leptospirosis, and some people don't receive antibiotics um, okay. at all. Um, of course, in dogs, we do recommend use of antibiotics and to start treatment um, as, as soon as possible um, when the suspicion of leptospirosis is there. And we use penicillin derivatives um, intravenously at the beginning, particularly if the animal is not eating. Um, and those could be um, um, ampicillin, could be amoxicillin, which we can get um, intravenously. It could be penicillin G. Um, in people, they do use um, cephalosporin and also third generation um, cephalosporins, which you probably don't approve of because it's not a first line antibiotic. And, um, and you don't need to use that. Um, so you could use, um, you could, I, I, ideally, you would go for something like amoxicillin yeah. or penicillin G in mm. veterinary medicine. Once the dog is eating and clinically stable and not vomiting, then we move on to doxycycline. Mm. Hopefully, to, um, to stop shedding um, and um, for, for that dog not to become a reservoir mm. um, of infection. So, yeah, I, I remember it's kind of like an acute management phase um, and then you move on to the doxycycline um, for, the, you know, for the carrier stage. Mm -hmm. And how, how long the course for that? Because, I mean, how, how long, you know, duration of therapy for both, roughly? 
Yeah. So I, again, I don't know that this has been looked at very, very mm. definitively. And um, people normally talk about two to three weeks of doxycycline, um, mm. and and certainly with intravenous antibiotic therapy, um, for as long as the as the dog is um, clinically needs it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. not and eating I, and stuff. Yeah. And I suppose the challenge is, I mean, do you? I mean, this, this is something I don't know the answer to, and it's me just purely thinking off the top of my head. If we're thinking about chronic carrier status, you know, do you, if, if funds allow, do you repeat testing on the urine at a later point? You, know, to you make sure could do. It? Yeah, I PCR, don't know that. It's not, it's not, um, I wouldn't say that it's um, generally a consensus of opinion mm. to, to screen them after infection, but, um, you know, you could run a PCR, um, maybe three, four weeks after stopping antibiotics. There's no point in doing it while the dog is receiving antibiotics mm -hmm. to see if the dog is shedding. Um, certainly, that might be something that you particularly would suggest when you've got an owner that's potentially immunosuppressed or yeah, you know, where, the risk, the where the risk might be higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so so um, prevention then, you know, um, and vaccination. Um, yeah. Yeah, so um, there are um, vaccines, obviously, we are all aware of for, um, for Leptospira. So we've got two main vaccines made by different companies. So we've got the L2 vaccine, which is the one that has been historically used and that has um, Cirovar, um, or the, the zero groups, I should say, um, Icterohemorrhagi and Canicola. Mm -hmm. um, so it's got Cirovars from those zero groups. And then we've got the L4, which is more recent, um, but has been around in the US for a while. It's slightly different from the, the, the ones that are licensed in Europe, but um, the ones in Europe have got um, the serovars from the zero groups, Victor Hemorrhagi, Canicula, um, Stralis, and Grypotifosa. Um, mm. So it's, um, it has more, um, it potentially it offers um, Better cover? Or? Better cover, yeah. yeah, yeah. Against um, serovars that um, might be becoming more prevalent. And certainly um, we do see more cases of leptospirosis in vaccinated dogs. Um, yeah. So it is likely that they are getting infected with serovars that are not in the vaccines. And for that reason, because the vaccines, they, they might, um, you know, the, with, with a vaccination, you don't get cross protection between different zero groups. Mm. Um, so the more zero bars that are in there, the better protection you're going to get theoretically. Okay. And what about, I mean, I have to admit, I might be asking you something that I, you haven't read up on recently, but I know initially with the L4, mm -hmm. there were concerns about vaccination reactions and things like that. I have to admit, it's not something I, I've, I should have looked at it before we did the podcast about whether you know, yeah. people should be reporting those suspected reactions to the VMD, yeah. um, if only as a concern. Is there, uh, are you aware of any data saying, you know, whether... Yeah, so, so the VMD released a statement um, because um, obviously there were lots of people talking about the um, increased incidence of reactions. It's always been the case with leptospira vaccines where people have reported a greater incidence of reactions than maybe mm -hmm. to other vaccines. Mm -hmm. And particularly with the L4, when it came out, there were lots of... Um, online reports of people saying um, that, you know, their dog had had a reaction and, and um, there was um, there, there was kind of um, bad press about the L4 vaccine. Um, I've looked at the data from the VMD. Um, apparently, well, they have, um, they've reported that the incidence of reaction both to the L2 and to the L4 is, is low, so it's rare. Um, mm. So they've got about two incidents um, of um, reactions for every 10,000 um, vaccines sold for the L2 and about seven um, for 10,000 vaccines sold for the L7, um, sorry, for the L7, for the L4. So okay. it's likely higher for the L4 than for the L2, but not massively so, and it's still considered rare. Yeah. Um, okay. And of course, some of these reactions are, the reported are mild reactions. I mean, sometimes it's just pain on injection, you know, so yeah. it's not, we're not talking about death in, in, in all of those cases by any. By yeah, any. so when you do a risk benefit analysis, you know, um, yeah. you've got to weigh up, you know, patient's potential exposure, you know, uh, a dog that's a lap dog that doesn't go out versus a dog that goes running through drains and things like that. Yeah, you want to For sure, but and you, and you say that, but um, apparently there is, a, there is a report in the US 
uh, <laughs> where the because you know this is important I think because then it brings into discussion is it is it the core vaccine should all dogs yeah, be vaccinated yeah, absolutely um, and um, I think I don't know if it would fall within the cate category of a core vaccine but I think yes all dogs should be vaccinated so unless you have a dog that doesn't leave the house. Um, then they should be vaccinated because, of course, you know, even in in very urban areas there are rats, Absolutely. Um, and Everyone. even the the poshest Yorkie in the world will sometimes drink a little bit of water. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and in the, you know, the, in the this, uh, in the US, they looked in in a very busy hospital where they were getting lots of um, lepto cases. Mm -hmm. They looked at prevalence amongst different breeds, and Yorkies were number one. Really? Yeah. Number one. Uh, well, I don't know if they were number one or number two, but there was a very but high incidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it Which was a very it was a very common breed to be affected. And I don't know why, it, maybe they have a lot of Yorkies in that clinic, but they, I'm just saying that it's not always the farm dog that gets. Yeah, them. which is a really good point. Really good point, because we, we, we sometimes use those kind of rationales to to make decisions like that, you know, um, you know the environment and the alleged exposure. Um, but as you quite rightly point out, in urban areas, you know, we've, you know, particularly cities and stuff, there's a lot more rats close by than what there are in the countryside in some scenarios and I guess what what I also just wanted to mention on this is you know with the VMD you know those stats and you know it seems like the comparable the um the you know, well there's a small difference with the L4 being slightly higher at seven per yeah. ten thousand but the 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 challenge always with those kind of data is, is making sure that people report those suspected reactions sure. you know um the only way that <clears throat> the organizations like that can make comments and statements with good evidence as if they are reported a bit like you know, one of my other areas where like for illegal importations of dogs mm -hmm. if, if the government doesn't know about them and they're not reported then mm -hmm. they can't put measures in place the same with the vmd you know it's 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 an easy thing to forget on a busy day um mm -hmm. but reporting any suspected reaction is really important for us to be able to make you know yes. um Good decisions on this. Yes. Um, so, so finally, um, just talking about, we mentioned um, the zoonotic potential of this, mm -hmm. um, and I suppose when we have a case in the hospital that mm -hmm. may have zoonosis, you know, what precaution? Uh, not zoonosis. Sorry, whoopsie. Um, mm -hmm. that, that <laughs> yeah, that may have leptospirosis. You know, how do we manage that in the clinic? But then also for the owner as well when the when the patient's discharged. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the, um, the um, well, the, what we do in our hospital, they um, dogs with leptospirosis do not go into isolation, but they are barrier they're barrier nursed in the in the wards. And when um, you say barrier, so what what kind of things? So um, the nurses handling that dog will wear a gown and gloves um, when handling the the animal. Um, the animal will be on a pink bed to make everybody aware that is a potential infectious source. And then we're particularly careful with um, handling of body fluids, uh, blood, saliva, urine. Um, so where appropriate, the animal will have a urinary catheter. So for example, if we are monitoring urine output, and then obviously we do warn people about potential splashing from um, urinary catheters and so on. Um, but if the animal does not need a urinary catheter for um, urine output monitoring, then um, we obviously the animal is walked out to urinate and the in two areas where they will not come in contact with uh, people or other dogs and and the, and the ground is infected after they've been to the toilet um, thankfully leptospira is easily inactivated but most um, disinfectants used in the clinic so it is an easy organism to kill and if you take the right precautions to avoid contact with cuts or mucous membranes splashing into face and so on um, then it's relatively easy to control within a kennel. Um, mm. When the animal starts antibiotics, in theory, shedding reduces or stops, but you should not take that for granted. Um, so just because the dog is on antibiotics, do not assume that it's not shedding leptospira. Um, and we should say the same to the owners and just advise them that um, there is a risk of infection to them or to other pets in the household. Mm -hmm. And again, to be very careful with handling of urine or body fluids, including saliva. Mm -hmm. um, and that if they develop any symptoms, um, and the symptoms of leptospirosis in people can be very mild, can be kind of flu-like symptoms, um, so if they develop any symptoms to contact their GP. Um, obviously, we would be even more um, um, cautious with people that are at risk, so immunosuppressed people, um, elderly patients and so on. Okay. Yeah. Cool. But yeah, it, 
Sorry. Oh no, I thought I heard a dog in the background. Well, it's, it's, my, it's a cat. It's oh, it's a cat. cat. That was the cat. He's okay. meowing. <laughs> cool. Well, um, thank you, Patricia. That was a really thorough review of Lepto. Um, and I hope everybody who's listening um, has found that useful. As always, we're um, very interested to hear any topics that you would like us to do in webinars or podcasts. So let us know. You know make suggestions in the, in the Facebook feed or email our marketing department. Also, all of these um, Davies Out of Hours podcasts um, are available on YouTube. So there's a series of uh, episodes um, that we've done over the last year or so. There's electrophysiology, um, cardiac ablation, um, there's surgical ones, there's um, uh, fecal matter transplant ones. And um, you know, like I said, this is the second of a series of um, uh, uh, infectious disease uh, uh, um, podcasts that we're doing. I think the next one we're planning to do is Babesia. So look out for that. And then just finally, you know, as it's, uh, you know, it goes without saying, you know, during this lockdown period, um, I hope you're all staying safe. Can I say one more thing? Oh, go on. Yeah. I did all my, fin- I did all my little <laughs> finish then. I'm yeah, sorry. Go on. I'm sorry. It's just, I wanted to say that there is a really, talking about leptospirosis, there is a very good consensus statement. Um, okay through JVM that you can download for free online. Yeah. Um, and it contains very updated information on a panel of experts, um, expert opinion, um, and it has answers to many of the questions that we've been presenting today. Okay, cool. So look out for that. That looks like it's an easily downloadable resource. Okay. And then I'm gonna, tr- so is that is that it, Pat? So we got any more? Yeah. No, that's so me then. Finish <laughs> <can I>? <laughs> <laughs> cool. So um, thank you once again, everybody for listening. Stay safe and hopefully have you tuning into further Davies Out of Hours podcasts. Thank you.